Three messages before today's interview educates and motivates you. First, if you're a domain name investor, don't you have unique legal needs that require domain name technical know-how and industry experience? That's why you need David Westlow of Wiley Rhine. Go search for David Westlow on Domain Sherpa, watch his interview, and you can see for yourself that he can clearly explain issues, can help you with buy-sell agreements, deal with website content issues and UDRP actions, and even help you write your website terms and conditions. David Westlow is the lawyer to call for internet legal issues. See for yourself at newmediaip.com. Second, managing multiple domain name marketplace and auction site accounts is a pain. Inevitably, you forget to sign into one and you lose a great domain, or worse. Now imagine using a single, simple to use, and comprehensive control panel to manage all of your accounts. That's Protrata. You can set up search filters, analyze domains, automate bidding, list domain names for sale, buy domains across all major marketplaces. Protrata also has a new semantic engine that builds Google-friendly websites with rich content and network feeds. Sign up at Protrata.com to get 20 free credits and start building and monetizing your domains today. Finally, if you have questions about domain names, where should you go to ask them? The answer is dnforum.com. Not only is DN Forum the largest domain name forum in the world, it's the best. You can learn about domain names and the industry, buy and sell domain names, talk about the domain name news that's happening in the industry, and even meet domainers just like yourself. Register for a free DN Forum account and begin advancing your skills and knowledge today. And when you do sign up, send me a friend request so we can connect on DN Forum. Here's your program. Hey everyone, my name is Michael Seiger and I'm the publisher of DomainSherpa.com, the website where you come to learn how to become a more successful domain name entrepreneur and investor directly from the experts. Many people in the domain name industry buy domain names daily and some people even sell them. We all, we all know domain name brokers, many of whom have been on the show, but there aren't too many successful domain name brokers who flip domains every day, who are spending their own money putting their own skin in the game to develop websites on premium, exact match domain names. Today, however, we do have one of those brokers. Andrew Rosener, CEO of MediaOptions.com, a past Sherpa from Domain Sherpa Interviews, is back to talk about how he bought and built Spearfishing.com, a spearfishing and free diving community. Andrew, welcome back to the show. Great to be here, Michael. Hey, and congratulations right off the bat, Broker of the Year nomination that just came out by uh, Rick Schwartz and Howard New for the traffic conference that's coming up in October of this year. Your business media options and you were nominated as Broker of the Year. Yeah, yeah, that was, uh, that was great to hear. I mean, it's always nice to get that pat on the back. Uh, we're definitely very honored to get the nomination and uh, we'll have to see. Have yep. to see what happens. Good, and and I encourage everybody that's watching get out to the traffic conference. There is nothing like meeting people in person, um, shaking hands, sharing a meal, having a drink together to cement your relationships in the industry. You know, Andrew, you and I met last year at the traffic conference. I I, I believe I two years ago. Um, even. Yeah, and so it was actually I think it might have been Domain Fest uh, two years ago, and then traffic last Maybe year. So that, that might be right. You know, definitely get to traffic. The movers and shakers of the industry uh, attend that conference, and uh, and uh, it's going to be a great event. So spearfishing.com. What's your motivation for creating a spear fishing and free diving community on the internet? So um, the story begins with my sister's boyfriend, who is a hardcore spear fishing uh, enthusiast, uh, if not fanatic. And um, you know, he was always trying to drag me out, but uh, that was back when I lived in Rhode Island, and you know, the water was probably fifty to sixty degrees Fahrenheit, yeah. um, and so it was a little tougher to get me out there. Um, but, uh, since we moved to Panama, um, you know, I found out that this is like the Mecca of spearfishing and, uh, I went out, I tried it. I absolutely loved it. And now I am, you know, 
Totally into it. Absolutely, totally enthused. So how often do you go out spearfishing? Um, I try to go, it off, go out as often as possible. The, um, I mean, the only thing holding me back is finding a dive partner to go with. Mm-hmm. Um, so for but safety I reasons, you want to get out, you know, once or twice a month. You know, gotcha. I would like to make that like four times. I'd like to go out once a weekend or yeah. once a week. So for safety reasons, like regular diving, you want to go out with a dive partner? Yeah, I mean, you know, particularly, I think even more so with free diving and, and especially spear fishing, you know, you're you're handling some some, you know, it can be a dangerous sport. You yeah. know, you've got the equipment, you've got uh, sharks are always a factor. Um, uh, you know, you you can black out. Um, mm. You know, there's there's a lot of. Uh, there's a lot, of, you know. There's a lot of dangers, um, yeah. and they can be managed. And um, you know, like like in any sport, um, you, as long as you are smart about it and uh, you know plan accordingly, then you know those risks can be can be managed. Right. But, um, but definitely, it's it's smart to to dive with a partner. Yeah. So free diving does that mean you're going down without you know the the compressed air on your back, without a full mask, without I don't know some of the other stuff. What what exactly does free diving mean? So no uh, self contained underwater breathing apparatus. Okay, mm-hmm. it's it's all about you, and this is really why you know free diving and spear fishing is, in my opinion, the ultimate sport. It's sort of a, a culmination of of hunting mm-hmm. and uh, you know real physical sport. Um, it takes endurance. It takes strength. It takes um, you know, a lot of different physical factors in order to dive, hold your breath. You know, this is 100% uh, breath holding. Um, so you got to dive, you know, to whatever depth you can reach. You're holding your breath the whole time. Ideally, you want to be able to reach a depth where you're comfortable that you can stay at for, let's say, maybe, you know, as long as possible, but but minimum maybe 10, 15, 20 seconds yeah. so that you yeah. can kind of look around, um, see if there's any fish to shoot. And, uh, and then you always have to keep in the back of your mind that if you do fish, it, uh, shoot a fish, <laughs> you need to be able to fight that fish and get back up to the surface. <laughs> right. So, and you don't want to abandon your equipment with some exactly, sort of spear exactly, in a that's, fish that's swimming away. Right. That worst case scenario, you know, let go of the gun. Gotcha. gotcha. So I remember so, going, um, deep sea fishing with my dad when I was a kid and we went uh, off of Long Beach and we're we're fishing and I'm you know I think we're bottom fishing I pull you know I reel up I got something on my hook and I'm reeling it up I reeled up this old spear fishing gun like it was the coolest really? thing yeah it was all like it looked like an actual gun like a rifle yeah and um and I don't think there was a spear in there or anything and it was totally like corroded and barnacles on it and but I thought it was the coolest thing are you using you know I've seen Full board guns that you can use underwater, but I've also seen just like the slings, like the old school, just the rubber rubber yeah, bands. Hawaiian, or whatever. Yeah, Hawaiian sling. So there's 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 a lot of different sort of subsets of spear fishing. Um, you know, even within guns, you've got um, you know sort of more automated guns uh, or the guns where you actually take the uh, you know pull back the bands. Yeah. You know, it could be one band, two bands, three bands, four bands, uh, depending on how much power you need size of the fish you're trying to shoot and the distance you're trying to shoot at. And um, so I use a gun. I use a, uh, I use a Rob Allen uh, gun. Rob Allen is a, a company out of South Africa. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm preferential to that brand. Um, but, uh, you know, there's Reef. There's um, a ton of different uh, uh, brands in the space. Yeah. Um, so you're, you're a new school kind of guy. You want to use the technology to your advantage. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if it's necessarily new school versus old school, but definitely, I mean, I guess Hawaiian sling or, or straight pole spear is, is probably older. Um, you know, you, you, you have the, um, I, I, it originated like in, in, in Greece in that area, um, using pole spear, three prong pole spear, um, uh, but yeah, I, I, I like to use, I like to use a gun. Yeah. Cool. So, um, so you had an interest in spear fishing. You're going out spear fishing on a regular basis in Panama. When did you acquire the spearfishing.com domain name? 
So I think it was about two years ago, mm-hmm. about two years ago, uh, the opportunity came up. It just kind of coincidentally, somebody uh, said to me, hey, you know, you interested in spearfishing.com? And I was like, yeah. And uh, we kind of went back and forth actually for a couple of months on the domain. Was it the and, owner of the domain or was it another broker that asked yeah, you? It, it was the owner of the domain and uh-huh. it was totally coincidental. I was selling him some other domain names. And, uh, you know, he mentioned to me that he had spearfishing.com and, and sort of that, that kind of got the conversation started. Yeah. And uh, it's funny. I, since I've acquired it, I've heard from so many other domainers who sort of knew the history of, of the spearfishing.com domain name. It, this guy actually bought it in an auction at eBay. And, you know, it was previously owned by the guy who is like the Michael Jordan of spearfishing. Oh, wow in like the 70s and um, you know he had a dispute with his partner his partner was actually in control of the domain and ended up you know they split up and the guy just put it on eBay <laughs> the other partner was trying to buy it back and then you know I heard from a couple of other domainers that were actually in that auction on eBay and <laughs> ended up selling at like 21,000 or 22,000 or something on eBay and um, uh, so I ended up buying it from that guy who won the auction on eBay. And wow. uh, So, of course, people are going to expect me to ask you, Andrew, how much did you pay for it? Um, it was a little bit of a complicated deal. I mean, there was some cash involved, and then I also gave him a whole bunch of other domain names. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. That does complicate it because then you have to put a value on those, and maybe you're estimating yeah. it high, and he's estimating it low. And So I, I think I gave him like 20000 cash. And then I don't know. I, I, I think I, I don't actually recall exactly, but I think we put enough. I think we put like about fifteen thousand or eighteen thousand dollars in 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 domain value, and that was like yeah, yeah. So it was a five figure sale. He made a, a, a profit on it probably if he were to sell the domains that you traded in yeah. for it and. Yep. Um, so did you use your valuation system, you know, that we'll be talking about later in the show, the, the one that I love to tell people when they email me and they say, how do I value the, this premium domain name that's in my space? And I say, well, if it's not a brandable, go look up the Rosner equation on Google and look at how Andrew came on the show and told us how he values domain names. Um, did you use your valuation formula to, so to evaluate? At that time, I hadn't really formulated, um, you know, the valuation uh, methodology yet. Um, you know, there was really just a lot of gut instinct involved Yeah, and kind of, you know, looking back, um, I would say, you know, let's say assuming that we're at 38,000 based on the domains and the cash or, or ballpark, Yeah, you know, I probably paid, um, more than what most resellers would pay, Yeah, but it was an emotional purchase. And once in a while you have those, you know, you just, if it's a, if it's category you're interested in, you know, it, it Sometimes it just has a higher value to you. So. Sure, definitely. Um, I, I've done that before. So the lesson yeah. learned for people who are buying premium domain names out there without a broker is to find out what all of the broker's passions are. Like yours is yeah. fishing, <laughs> Elliot's is small dogs. I'm just joking. Elliot likes uh, much more. <laughs> find out what you're passionate about. You buy said them, it. And then sell them to a broker. <laughs> Because you guys are are flipping names, you know the values, you're willing to transact. All right. So when you bought it, you've said that it was an emotional transaction. You you probably paid a little bit more because you love the sport. Would you, you know, was your intention to buy it and flip it? Or was your intention, intention to hold it for appreciation because you know the market? Or was your intention at the time to build it out into spearfishing.com today? So, okay, so at the time I was sort of looking at, at the space, I was going on the blogs and, uh, you know, trying to increase my, 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 my knowledge about, about spearfishing, um, not so much from the business perspective, but from, from the hobbyist. Mm-hmm. And um, what I realized was that there was no major, um, you know, there were some well-established brands from manufacturers of equipment in the space, but there was no major sort of centerpiece. Mm-hmm. There was no, you know, there, there's... There's some blogs that are popular. There's forums which are popular, um, you know. But no, they were sort of outdated. There was no like real centerpiece. So when I saw Spearfishing.com, I thought, wow, you know, somebody in this space, as as the space evolves um, and and you know increases in popularity, which which it's it's skyrocketing. Um, 
somebody's going to want this name and it's going to be worth more than what I'm willing to pay. But ultimately, I did have the idea that I wanted to build it out. And, um, you know, I think there's no better way to sort of dive into a hobby than say, OK, well, I'm going to make it a business, too. Right. Um, so. So, yeah. So ultimately, I, I knew I wanted to develop it. But but I also kind of, you know, I had the business perspective that. It has to be worth more than what I'm willing to pay for it, right. you know, to somebody who is well established in the space. Yeah. And if somebody uh, came to you today with a six figure offer that that uh, met your purchase price, met your development cost, met your time and and you saw yourself making a profit, would you sell it? I, I mean, everything has a price. I, I, I certainly would sell it. Um, we actually just recently turned down a hundred thousand dollar offer. Really? Um, yeah. But. It just, it's not worth it. I mean, the blood, the sweat, the tears, the time, the energy um, that went into to building this thing out, um, you know, it's just, it's not worth it at that level. Yeah, definitely. So how many active or avid enthusiast spear fishermen, people, <laughs> women, do you think there are in the world? Okay, so we've been doing a little bit of Facebook advertising. Uh -huh. And if Facebook is any indication... We are marketing specifically only to people who have spearfishing listed in their interests, okay? Right, right. And so if Facebook is any indication, Facebook tells me that there's something around 2.6 million people who are registered on Facebook who have spearfishing wow. listed as an interest. So I don't, you know, that's some indication. And I that's don't, only Facebook, the 1 billion people that Facebook. are on Facebook. And of course, you know. My brother's not on Facebook and maybe he's a spear fisherman or he's gone a yeah. few times or – yeah. Is yeah. there a print magazine in the industry? Yeah, there's a couple. There's, there's a couple. There's so. the, yeah, there, there's two. Um, I don't know what their distribution is. Yeah. Um, there's one called Ultimate Spear Fishing, but I think they've only put out three or four issues. And there's another one called Hawaiian Skin Diver, um, which is my personal favorite. They do a great job. Um but it's much more Hawaii focused. Mm -hmm. So there's like the whole rest of the world and right. then there's Hawaii in the spear fishing. Exactly. Exactly. And Hawaii is very Hawaii centric. Yeah. Uh, it's almost like a different planet in the industry. But um but they still they publish an amazing magazine with great photos and great articles. And uh, you know, I kind of aspire to be online what they are in print. So yeah. well that's great. Uh, and I and I bring up uh, these these points, Andrew, because I know you've given it thought, and somebody else that wants to that has a great domain name that wants to develop out a publishing site. That's the way you do research. You got to look at the number of books there are on the topic, the number of active print magazines there are, the number of websites, blogs, communities, organizations, um, discussion forums. As you said, those all are indication how big the pool is. And you yeah. know, to your point, I should do a tutorial of how to actually do advertising on Facebook because it's a remarkable place where you can go and say, I want to reach only people that are named Andrew in <laughs> Panama. And you can put ads up on the side of their Facebook. It's, it's phenomenal. So, you know, being able to specify search against interests and in bio for spearfishing is phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, there's been all this knocks about Facebook advertising and that it's not effective. And, and I could see that it wouldn't be that effective for, for a big brand like Ford, right. okay, or, or, you know, Gillette. But for my uses, I mean, it's been incredibly effective because, like you said, you can really target a very specific, uh, specific demographic with certain mm -hmm. interests. Um, you know, I, I really, I actually, I'm, I'm so intrigued. Like, I, I'm not really much of a Facebook user. I'm sort of a passive Facebook user. Yeah. Once in a while, I post things and, you know, I'll post some cool pictures if I do something cool that I think my friends maybe care about. <laughs> um, but from an advertising perspective, man, I am, I'm really, really intrigued. It's actually yeah. sort of got mm -hmm. me thinking about other businesses, uh, you know, that are super niche, mm -hmm. that pertain to specific interest groups that I could launch a website for because I think Facebook's a great and relatively cheap way to drive traffic. It definitely. And, uh, and yeah, exactly. And and just to uh, uh, highlight that point. So, you know, I, I've talked briefly that I bought the, the domain name of the island that I live on just outside of Seattle, 
which, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the Costello brothers I have to, to curse or thank for getting me motivated about buying my geo domain. And there was another group on my island that had a Facebook group and they labeled it uh, Bainbridge Island, Washington. They had like 2000 people or something that were liking it. I bought advertising to advertise our area and differentiate it for Bainbridge Island, Washington. And I advertised to their group members. It is, yeah. it's unbelievable. It's a, it's a, it's a benefit and it's a curse because if you build up spearfishing.com on Facebook, somebody else can come in and advertise to your people and you can't stop them. But if you want to yeah. try and pull people away from somebody else has established, it's a great way to get onto their, onto their feeds. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, so fantastic. All right, so let's jump into this, Andrew. When did you first start developing spearfishing.com? We started, um, okay, so I would say we really started about one year ago. Okay. Um, so you bought the domain name about two years ago, and then you started developing in earnest. You might have been thinking about it, doing your research, doing your due diligence, but you started yeah. developing about a year ago. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I think we, you know, we signed on the dotted line about a year ago, and and we um, we hired uh, Tia Wood uh, to do the development. Tia Wood dot com. And, Tia Woods Wood or Woods. Tia Wood singular. Woods yeah. dot yeah. com, and she yep. is um, a well known um, in the domain name space. Yep, she's done a lot of development uh, for other people in the domain space. Um, I think she's worked a lot with Elliot, and mm-hmm. um, I don't know who else. Yep. Uh, um, but uh, yeah, she, she's done great work. I think so, that this was an ambitious project um, you know, for her. I think it was the, probably the biggest project she's done to date. Um, so, but it was a great fit for the two of us because um, you know, it was kind of like, it's the biggest project I've done to date. And you know, we both could sort of have a, 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 a sort of grow into it together. Because yeah. it's hard to know if you're not experiencing development and, and looking back, this is the biggest lesson is it's hard to know what you want before you build it. Right. Um, so, you know, that, that was, that was really the reason I think that it took so long to, to complete, um, is, you know, it, we sort of, the project grew with us mm-hmm. and, uh, she did a great job. You know, the finished product we are super, super happy with. Um, actually it's, it's not entirely done. We, we're, we're, we've launched, um, but we've sort of launched, um, we're, we, we kind of plan to, to roll out in like two or three phases. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've launched the social aspect of the site. Uh, it's full swing. It's active. People are signing up every day. People are using the forum, um, messaging with each other. You know, it's, it's fantastic to see. Nice. Um, but so you the decided next- to do a multi generational plan. Don't try to eat the whole elephant at one time. Just what do we need in order to launch phase one, and then we'll work on phase two, and we'll learn from phase one and what people like and don't like. Exactly. Very smart. So, okay. So I want to give the audience an idea of how others built sites and went through the process so they can learn if they want to develop out a site. And you already talked about one thing is being able to define what phase one is going to be. And oftentimes you don't know what you want until you start developing it. You know, Tia may design something and you may say, well, that doesn't make intuitive sense to me. Can we do it like this? And I wouldn't it be great if we could do this between members or something like that. So you don't know until you're actually in it. Um, but let me ask you a little bit more about the contract with Tia. Did was it a firm fixed price based on what your specifications were at a given time or did you contract with her at an hourly rate? Yeah, no, we, we, we contracted, we agreed upon a uh, sort of a set price mm-hmm. um, to be paid in stages as we hit milestones. Okay. Okay, so it was a firm fixed price paid out in stages upon completion. Yeah. Okay. And then how did you modify or how did you and Tia agree to modify that based on the changes that you said you'd want later on? Or was that included? Um, so most of that was included. I mean, you know, I, I try to be fair, you know, in that if I think something I'm adding or changing is outside of the original scope, then, then you know, obviously we need to compensate sure. uh, the developer for that. Um, but... Uh, but yeah, I mean, probably if Tia were to go back, she would probably want to redefine the scope of the project more specifically. <laughs> um, 
but yeah, I mean, we 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 more or less stayed within this the, the broader scope of the project that, that we originally defined. Gotcha. So a year of Tia's time developing it, I I would yeah, assume she wasn't dedicated. Um, okay, it know, wasn't just, dedicated. I, she was doing her own blog. She was doing development yeah, for other people. She was design. Other me in between. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Makes sense. Are you um are you willing to give a rough estimate of how much you spent to get version one live on the website? <laughs> uh. uh yeah, I mean, more for Tia's sake, I, I, I just because, you know, I think that she gave me some preferential pricing because this was the biggest project she had done and, mm -hmm. you know, there was some learning curve involved and I don't think that she would do it at the same price. So I prefer not to, to sure. share that. Okay. Um, Can I ask you if it was over, say, $10,000? Um, all in, we're probably in that ballpark. Okay. That's it. All right. Um, so how did uh, how did Tia pick the technology that you were going to use to build out spearfishing.com and how did uh, and what kind of input did you have on from a technology standpoint? So ultimately, um, I was presented with a couple of different options and uh, I went to a few of my friends who are either developers or have some experience in developing their own projects mm -hmm. and um, it was a lot of mixed feedback, actually. But ultimately, we decided to use Joomla as our uh, sort of content management system. Mm -hmm. And um, then we did a lot of customization on top of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And, and also, you know, so spearfishing.com is a fairly complex site. We've got a lot of different social networking um, features. We've got contests. We've got, um, you know, a forum, we've got a blog, we've got an article section. People can submit their own articles and there's a whole, you know, automated process for them to be paid for their articles. Mm. And so it's a fairly complex thing. So actually, I don't know a ton about all the different elements behind the scenes. I know Joomla was a content management system, but I know that there's a lot of other systems that were sort of integrated to manage those other processes. Sure. Yeah, and, and for those not familiar with Joomla, it's spelled J-O-O-M-L-A. It is an open source framework similar to WordPress, which more people are aware of because it powers but more way websites. More but complex than WordPress. But Joomla is more complex. It actually can do more than WordPress, um, and it's much more uh, extensible than I would say WordPress. It's a yeah. it's a much more uh, structured framework. Um, but at the same time, the learning curve is much higher. It's much higher uh, than WordPress as well. Yeah. Yeah. So it's got pluses and minuses, just like yeah. WordPress has pluses and minuses. But for those that want to look at it, it is open source. It's free to use. You can download it. You can install it at many different hosts and, and begin using that. So you worked on it for a year. During that year, there was a um, – uh, I'm not sure what service you use. There's a service called LaunchRock, I believe, .com. It, it allows you to put up a, a little uh, window on the screen that says, we're going to be launching soon. Come give me your email address. And I signed up on spearfishing.com, and, um, and I'm sure a lot of other people did as well from your previous interview that you did when we, when we went over it. How many registered users do you have today on the website? Um, okay, so I think we have about... I don't know offhand. I, 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 I want to say it's somewhere around 200. Uh -huh. um, and so on a given day, there's generally around four times as many guest members on the site as there right. are registered members. Gotcha. So we're trying to find ways to convert those guests because those guests are obviously interested in spearfishing. Right. Um, but we want to convert them into registered members. Um, and, you know, obviously it's free of charge. You know, it's just it's just – we just want to grow the community. So yeah, exactly. And get more information from them so you understand their needs so you can maybe sell them something or offer an affiliate code or yeah. what have you. So what are you doing to get more people to the website today? So I, as I mentioned before, we're doing some Facebook advertising. Um, we're, we're sort of doing anti-SEO. There's been so many changes with Google recently um, that I think – that nobody knows what SEO means anymore or how to do proper SEO. So we're going back to the basics and we are just trying to add as much unique and original content that we think our readers want to read. Um, we are 
trying to drive as much traffic, good quality traffic as we possibly can. Um, I own a lot of other uh, URLs in the space, um, which is maybe something else we even want to talk about. But but we we also own SpearGuns.com and, yeah. and um, Spearo.com. So for those that don't know, if you are a spear fishing enthusiast in the community, you're referred to as a Spearo. Yeah. So uh, actually, Insider information here. <laughs> yeah, I think that's so, actually my my favorite brand of all three of Spearfishing.com, SpearGuns.com. And Spiro.com, I, I really like Spiro. I actually have some, yeah. some cool ideas of what to do with that later. So that's S-P-E-A-R-O.com? Yes. Okay. So, yeah, if you're in the know, then knowing where to go is, uh, you know, a cool thing. So, yeah, you could probably do some sort of maybe so, paid membership or something for yeah, people so, that so, really get it. Yeah. So we're, mm -hmm. we're, 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 we're funneling because all of those names get some type-in traffic. So we're funneling that traffic um, to the site. And, so do you uh, have links on those other sites to spearfishing.com or do you just redirect right the traffic? Right now we're just doing a, a, a forward, a 301 yep. permanent forward. Gotcha. A, a re permanent redirect. Mm -hmm. So, um, But ultimately, I think we're going to develop those out into independent sites that are connecting to spearfishing.com. Yep. Okay. And I should probably clarify, how many weeks have you been live on spearfishing.com now? We're only – I think we're in our fourth week now. Yeah. Okay. So it's very – um, very new, very new into the yeah. process. So you're looking at really, you're just gathering data. You're saying we're getting, you know, a, a registration a day, a couple registrations a day that are coming in. They're adding to our 200 registrations, and really, you're just gathering data before you actually do anything. Because I'm sure you're yeah. thinking about the same things. I could pop up a free PDF download if they register, or I can, you know, do whatever. But right now, you're just trying to get more traffic and see how they're converting, yeah. so you can compare. Later so on. we're doing we're doing also we're doing a contest. Um, we advertised that contest on Facebook, which was really successful. So basically, we gave I think there's 11 steps, mm -hmm. and if you register as a user, and then I, I don't remember all the steps, but it was like like us on Facebook, invite a friend, mm -hmm. uh, comment on a forum post. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. There was a few more. Right. And if you complete all those steps, then uh, you're you'll be entered to win a uh, spear gun. Okay. So we're going to give away a, a $350 spear gun to one member uh, among the first hundred who complete those steps. Damn it, I got to get over there. Yeah. <laughs> so that's been really successful uh, in terms of, of getting, uh, not only getting people to register, but also to you know, get some interaction on the site. Get them engaged, make sure they know how to do all of those steps. It's a great yeah. idea, yeah. So who came up with that campaign? Who came up with the idea that we're going to run them through the gauntlet so that they know how to operate everything on the website, know how to uh, interact and, um, you know, uh, and track all of those different things? Um, I think that was my idea, but I don't want to take 100% of the credit because I, I'm not sure. Yeah. I've, bounced out, I've bounced around so many ideas with so many different people, yeah. uh, including Tia, who's had some, some also some great ideas about um, you know, how to engage the community. Um, so I'm not entirely sure. Yeah. And so who actually tracks that I have completed all 11 steps and that I'm in the running for that spear gun? I have the ability to track it, but up to this point, I'm sort of just, you know, we're on the honor system. Yeah. Gotcha. All right. Um, so who runs spearfishing.com? Do you have somebody that moderates and, you know, edits the articles that go live and answers questions and things like that? So right now, um, I am moderating, although Tia is also, um, doing some of that mm -hmm. and, um, I'm editing the articles, um, and then also, so we also have somebody that's doing some of the social um, sort of, uh, what do you call it, social networking uh, engagement, like right. updating our Facebook, updating our Twitter. Sure. Okay. Makes sense. And so you just outsource that to somebody that knows all those social media channels, knows how to write content for them and link it back to the articles or the discussion forum posts or whatever well, you have going on. Well, somebody in-house. We have a, somebody that does marketing in-house. Gotcha. Marketing in-house for... Media Just spearfishing.com or no, media options. options? Media options. Gotcha. So she works across multiple sites that you own, multiple websites. Yes. Yeah. Great. Um, 
All right, so let's talk about the business plan for a few minutes. I see Google AdSense being displayed across the site. Is that the only revenue that you're generating or that you plan to generate revenue from? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, the Google AdSense, I almost would prefer to take it off. Um, but it's sort of a placeholder for now. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, we want to get, let's say, two or three um, really heavy hitter advertisers to advertise on the site. And my goal is actually not to go within this proficient community. My goal is to bring in uh, some, some really heavy hitters like, like uh, Ford trucks or Gillette razors or um, somebody who's going to be really interested in our demographic. Mm -hmm. So back in 2001, spearfishing.com was a forum. It was just a pure forum, nothing fancy, and it was a top 10,000 Alexa rank website. So it was getting some major traffic. So that was also when I bought it. One of the reasons that I was so ambitious about it is that I thought, wow, you know, there is a market here. If yeah. this was a top 10,000 Alexa rank site looking like it did, then, um, you know, there's a lot of traffic here. Yeah, they, they, and probably a lot of organic backlinks coming in that are still valid today from the early days. I mean, they, they, you know, there's a decent amount, but there's not yeah. a ton of, huh. of, of backlinks. Um, but it was more so that I just, I saw the potential to garner that traffic. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually did quite a bit of research and uh, hired some people to do some research into the demographics of the spearfishing community. And that is really interesting. Um, I, I'm just kind of pulling these from the top of my head, but sure. you know, our demographic is like 70% uh, between the ages of 35 and 45, uh -huh. um, something like 70 or 75% of the spearfishing community earns over uh, $120,000 a year. Wow. Um, I think it's like 78% have a college degree, 40% uh, have a postgraduate degree. Um, you know, it's a really yeah. interesting demographic. I think it's like 80% male, 20% female. So highly educated, highly affluent, targeted yeah. uh, age, mostly yeah. male. So advertisers who want that demographic, it's key. I mean, that's a demographic with some serious mm. buying power. Right. Um, so I think it's a really interesting demographic. I haven't focused on any advertisers yet because I think I'd be underselling myself at this point. Yeah. You know, once we get up to, um, you know, a more appropriate traffic level, <laughs> then I would like to go out and, you know, talk to some of the advertising agencies and, and see if we can find a couple of, you know, people who really can appreciate that demographic. Yeah. No, definitely. That's smart. So you've got the advertising sort of as just a block placeholder that, that yep. you know, if people spent a year, if it takes a year, let's say, to, to build up the traffic so that you can go out and sell the demographic and enough traffic, people know there's going to be advertising on the site. It's not like it's no advertising now and then you introduce it later. Exactly. You're setting the expectation yep. and making a few bucks along the way, although it's probably not significant yet. Yeah, I think, I think it's like, I think we earn about five or ten bucks a day with um, with uh, the Google AdSense. Yeah. And then also down in the do uh, bottom right-hand corner, you'll see like where we have, uh, we're marketing some products and that's just basically through a Shopzilla feed. Uh -huh. um, so we're also earning about the same amount with Shopzilla um, on a PPC basis uh, with, you know, marketing those spear phishing products. Uh, but ultimately, so our phase two rollout will be the full e-commerce integration. And so right now we're evaluating a couple of different e-commerce platforms and trying to decide exactly how we want to integrate it into spearfishing.com or alternatively launching a separate e-commerce site on spearguns.com mm -hmm. and leaving spearfishing as the sort of social networking site. Right. Um, so that's a decision that's yet to be made. Uh, but phase two involves the e-commerce rollout. And we have got a killer partner in California who is the licensee of all the major brands that we want to market uh, for the United States and they have already you know agreed to do uh, drop shipping for us oh, wow. and negotiated some very attractive terms and uh, we are I, I mean, I am super, super, super pumped to work with these guys. So you need really to build up the traffic so then you can launch the e-commerce and then you can make the higher profit margins because, you know, we've, we just talked about AdSense and we talked about your affiliate links and you're probably, you know, just like Amazon, you're making 2 to 5% on affiliate links. 
But as I did in a previous interview about three weeks ago, drop shipping can have enormous margins. And if you have never heard of drop shipping or never um, uh, discovered what kind of margins you can make on drop shipping, go watch that interview on how to create a drop shipping website because the margins can be anywhere from 10% up to 50%, depending on how close to the manufacturer you are. You deal a yeah. customer service, you don't take any inventory, you take the money, you pay the manufacturer. It's a, it's a great business model. Absolutely. So I'm really, really excited about that. I mean, I think ultimately that's where the money is yep. uh, for the website. I mean, I, I actually, I think the advertising, if we find the right advertising partners, I think there's also some, some, some pretty significant uh, money to be made there. Yeah. Uh, you know, right. and I think it can be a win-win for us and the advertiser. But, uh, but ultimately, you know, the e-commerce is is where I see, uh, you know, the real revenues for the yeah. site. So, phase one, which you've launched, is the social community. Build up the traffic. Build up the registrations. Build up the traffic. Phase build two is the goodwill. E yeah, it's really it's build up our goodwill. You know, build, build up, up goodwill. Community, yep. um, you know, build up the trust with the community. Mm -hmm. Show them that you know. We're trying. We're you know we're really in this. We're yeah. really you know, we're trying to make something that's awesome for them. Right. Um, and then phase two will be an e-commerce component, maybe a yep. drop shipping component. And then what do you have envisioned? You know, of course everything's going to change between now and when you do that. Just like everybody else that builds out a community. But what what do you see maybe down the road after e-commerce? Um. So once we launch our e-commerce component, we want to actually start. Uh, sponsoring some some of the major tournaments, mm -hmm. um, like the uh, the World Championships actually just took place. Oh wow! Uh, the U.S. National uh, Championships just started yesterday in California. I didn't even realize there was competition. So like surfing, oh, man, where you go out and, yeah, and yeah. You have a certain amount of time in the water and you gotta catch some waves. You yep. go out in the water with a spear gun and whoever catches the biggest fish. Uh, so it's generally done on gross weight. Uh -huh. So usually these tournaments are over a couple of days and uh, you have teams oh, wow. and you get, you know, sort of point scores for different species. The, the harder to get species have a higher point score. Wow. And then cool. there's also, you know, point score based on the gross weight of the total catch. Um, it, it's really, I mean, when you get into it, when you look into it, oh, yeah. it's really a fascinating sport. And yeah. Yeah, yeah. These guys are admirable. I mean, I'm an amateur. These, some of these guys are going down for seven, eight minutes, uh, breath holds, you know, and they are shooting monster fish. I have a friend here in Panama who this guy is from, uh, he's from Louisiana. He is a machine. <laughs> he goes down for like five minutes and this guy shoots like two, 300 pound fish. Oh he just showed me a picture of a 270 pound yellowfin tuna that he shot. I mean, that probably weighs see, more than him. He's probably not 270 oh, pounds. Man, double him. So he it's shoots double, it. He's got to shoot it in the head because if he doesn't kill that thing, it's going to it's gonna take him out. Yeah, I mean, right of your life. But yeah. it's – um. so, I mean, they're, they're, when you're shooting big fish like that, it's a whole other ball game. I mean, basically, you have a large buoy up on the surface mm. with a line attached, excuse me, to your gun. Yeah. So it's basically – Shoot the fish, let go of the gun, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. try not to get tangled in the rope, <laughs> go back up to the surface, and then chase the buoy with the boat. <laughs> and then haul that thing up to the surface. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Wow. I mean, about a multi-hour process. To, so to just, for the, uh, just for the environmentalists and the, you know, the PETA fans in the audience, you eat everything that you shoot, right? And, you know, that's really, that's like the, 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 the moral of the sport is, is shoot what you're going to eat um, or what you're going to give to your friends and neighbors. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's what's great about it. I mean, you know, there is a lot of pushback from, from, from environmentalists and, 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 you know, animal rights people and, and, you know, whatever. On the surface, I can understand that. But look at the sport. Look at the foundation of the sport. And there's obviously, like any sport, there's people that abuse it. Mm -hmm. But... The vast majority of enthusiasts in the spearfishing community are there to shoot what they eat. Mm -hmm. um, yep. And, you know, unlike normal fishing where you don't, you know, there's bycatch, um, you know, there's, there's, you, you don't know what you're going to catch. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, and it's, you're, you're sitting in a chair, you cast a line, mm -hmm. you know, you're waiting for something to, to, to catch on and then you reel it in. You know, there's no real... 
I, I mean, listen, I've been an avid fisherman my whole life, so, so nobody should be offended. But, you know, it's, it's not a sport by definition in terms of, you know, the physical necessity. Right. Okay. Um, now, granted, reeling in a 275-pound tuna from a rod and reel is a lot of yeah. physical necessity. But you get my point. Yeah, definitely. Um, whereas with spearfishing, you know, really, you are in, you're in, you're out of your zone. You are in, you're underwater, you're holding your breath. You know, in my opinion, the fish has the advantage. Um, so it's really, it's like you against the fish. You know, it's really true hunter gatherer. I, I really, I love it. I, I think that it's, I think that it really goes back to our roots. You know, it's, yeah. it's really a, a true sport. Yeah. Anybody that, you know, and I'm not a big scuba guy, but I've gone a couple of times. And when I get in that water and it's probably because I'm such a novice at it, but when I get in the water and I go down deep and I see a shark, it's clear that I'm not the king anymore, that no, I'm in no, somebody no, no, else's no. territory. Yeah, so who have no advantage. Yeah. Yeah, it's not like yeah, and I'm sure it's the same way with with you know people that want to go out and shoot elephants or what have you. But uh, you know that elephant's a, a big animal. Yeah. So all right, so we're getting spear fishing. The elephant you can shoot from a long distance with a <laughs> rifle. True. You know, with spear fishing, you have to be in real close proximity to shoot that fish. That you know, true. we're talking yeah. a maximum of like 15 to 20 feet, absolute wow. max. Wow. So, you know, it it. it, it, it it's a sport. It, yeah. it, there's a, you know, there's no question about it. You need, um, you know, you are out of your element. You are in their element, and they have the advantage. You know, it's yeah. All right. So I want to talk about the broker business. Business. I want to talk about um, your your uh, um, e Rosner equation. I want to talk about a couple of websites that you're develop that you've developed. One you sold. One you're developing. Um, so, but first, before we move on to that, spearfishing.com, I think I've gone over all my questions. We understand who you're targeting, how you're reaching them, how you're marketing, how you're tying in social media, um, what your uh, game plan is for the near future, uh, long term, growing the revenue, how it's a passion of yours, so you love it and you probably want to do more because you want to learn more about it. Um, cool. I think, we're, uh, I think we're set on that. All right, so let's dig into the Rosner equation because... I get a ton of emails uh, that uh, from people saying, hey, I bought this domain name. Did I overpay? Or, Mike, I'm thinking about buying these domain names, and I'm more than happy to answer questions. Clearly, I'm not an expert. I defer to the Sherpas that come on the show, and I, you know, I say to most of them that are actually buying premium generic domain names, as we've defined them, not brandables, but generic ones. Um, go look up the Rosner equation, watch your video from the last time, then go read the article that we wrote up from that because there was a lot of clarification that happened after the video. And uh, so today you, you said that you wanted to talk about the Rosner equation and how that's changed from the last time you came on the show. So we wrote this article, I'm just bringing it up, July 17th, 2011. So it's been about a year that this article has been up that you'll see in the number one position on Google if you search for the Rosner equation. And it was... So we need just, a name change for that. No, no, no. I love it. Like, come on. Who gets an equation named after them? So um, it's basically A times B times C times D. It's the exact match monthly search volume. And we show you how to do that uh, via Google. And so, you know, we, we say U.S. if you're in the U.S., global if you're looking at the global, the average cost per click from Google. So you got to understand the bias associated with that. So it's uh, times the click-through rate, which we were using as 35%, so you multiply it by 0.35, and then the payback period. This is an investment. You may want to flip it. You may want to keep it long-term for development. We assume 12 months here. Mm -hmm. How does how have you modified this equation from a year ago, Andrew? Um, okay, so, I mean, the foundation of the equation more or less stays the same. Mm -hmm. um, what we've modified is essentially what what is the market paying, um, you know, the economy is not so hot, as everybody right. knows. Um, you know, the domain reseller market is um, slower than a year ago. Um, and there's just been significant Google algorithm changes in the SEO community. Um, so taking into account some of those factors, um, we've shortened the payback period. Mm -hmm. um, and... We're, we're taking a multiple 
uh, in terms of the amount of traffic that you can expect to get from from Google from being in the number one place in Google, mm-hmm. um, and and based on a lot of feedback that I've had from some people in the SEO community and um, you know people that are really developing you know sites for some of these competitive keywords, um, there's so much more involved to get a site ranked number one for a competitive keyword. Mm-hmm. So basically, we're taking the sort of the competition um, into account. So if it's like a highly competitive keyword. We're sort of knocking that down from 25% of that traffic down to more like 10% to 15%. Um, now, if we're talking about something with a low, like when you're looking up in the Google AdWords keyword tool, you know, it tells you the competition level, whether it's you know high, medium, low, and right. there's some bar graph. Um, and we're, we're taking that into account. You know, so at the high end, it's, it's 25%, you know, and that's for like a low competition keyword where it's probably not that difficult to, to take your generic domain name and rank for number one. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you're in a high competition keyword uh, vertical, like mortgages, insurance, um, you know, then it's probably better to adjust that down to 10% or 12% or 15%. Yep. Okay. That makes sense. So you're adjusting the estimated click-through rate. Uh, assuming it can get to the number one position down to 10 to 15 percent if it's highly competitive you're adjusting it down from 35 percent listed in the article down to 25 percent just to bring it back in check with the market for for low competitive keywords makes sense payback period of 12 months um, are you still keeping 12 months or now are you adjusting that down as well um, no if that, sorry for the, for the most part we are keeping it at 12 months okay yeah yep now the thing that we are that we never sort of took into account, and I, I believe we didn't mention it in, in the last interview, is that there are a ton of other factors that ultimately go into the final number of this valuation, right? And it's just impossible for us to discuss all of those different factors. But you know, sort of each domain, you know, has a different has different variables, um, you know, depending on the domain itself, depending on the market, depending on the vertical. Um, you know, but some of those variables that you, you know, that we sort of could discuss or, or they're, you know, common across all domains are like, you know, how many words. So I've had many people email me after that interview, like, you know, with a five word domain name and yeah, that domain has 15,000 exact match searches in Google, but just because that name really has zero brand factor, you kind of have to discount it. Um, so, you know, if your domain is five words, even if it has the same amount of search volume as that domain that's one or two words, it's just going to be worth significantly less. And I'm not exactly sure what factor to put on that um, specifically, but it needs to be handicapped. Yeah. Um, and then by the same token, if that domain name is easily replaceable, so meaning that there are other, other uh, let's say, other keyword domain names, mm-hmm. okay, with similar search volumes, similar CPCs in the same vertical. If there are mul- you know, many other options available mm-hmm. to a developer in that space, um, that also handicaps the value of your domain name. Right. So clearly, um, as you get to two and three and four and five word domain names, that becomes the case. But there's only one spearfishing.com. There's only one way to define spearfishing. So for the, yeah. you know, the ultra, pre- I know everything over hand registration is defined as premium. So, you know, we need to talk about industry defining category killing domain yeah. names that are generic, like a single word spearfishing, loans.com. Uh, yeah checkingaccounts.com, you know, defining, you can't define that in a, in a single word. Um, yep. This is the formula for that. And if you look yep. at more words, then you need to factor in, are there other phrases that get the same search volume, target yep. the same audience, uh, have the same cost per click that, and if there are, then that devalues the, yeah. the As you get lower down the totem pole in terms of keyword value for any particular va- vertical, you know, I think that the handicapped, the, the the handicap that you apply to your valuation needs to be increased. Yeah. 
Okay, that makes sense. So maybe we even need like another factor E on this formula, A times B times C times D times E. And E is yeah. what, other, what other factors can reduce the value. And, and so one of them is how many words are in there? How many other options are there for that word? What, what other things, uh, I can't remember back to the original conversation, what other major areas are there, Andrew, that would cause you to think that a domain name might be devalued from, from what comes out of just four factors? Um, the age of the domain name is definitely a factor that can, that can influence whether it's, you know, the value should be higher or lower. Okay. Um, obviously older domain names have more value. Right. Um, the number of organic backlinks, clean backlinks to that domain name, uh, can certainly increase the value of that domain name. Yep. But at the same token, uh, you know, sort of a spammy backlink profile on a domain name certainly devalues the domain name. Um, uh, what are some other factors? Um, okay, so some of these exact match keyword domain names also have the brandability factor. And that would significantly, so if you've got search volume, you know, generic search volume and brandability, you know, that's going to significantly increase the value of that domain name. Like spearfishing.com, for instance. Yeah, we've got an exact match domain name. It's got exact match search volume, you know, CPC. We can plug it into the formula, come out at evaluation. But at the end of the day, you know, we've also got the category defining brand. Um, so it's, it's, you know, and, and I think like the Costello brothers also always talk about that. Yep. And uh, I don't remember on which blog it was, but there was some feedback. It might have been on your blog. But there was some, some sort of feedback, um, maybe pushback against my valuation methodology, um, you know, and then it didn't take into account, you know, the brand value. Um, and, and I think that there is, you know, there is something to say for that. My problem with that is simply that my whole premise for coming out with a valuation methodology and publicizing it in this way and sort of getting up on my soapbox was that I think it's important. I think that it's important that we have a methodology that is, um, you know, generally accepted. I think that that's, it, it's critical for moving the, the, the industry forward. So um, I think it's hard to put a metric on brandability and brand value. Um, and so for that reason, I've left it out of the valuation yeah. at this point. Um, but I obviously, I mean, I welcome anybody who can come and say, you know, this is a way to add another factor to the valuation based on value. Right. Uh, and and the, at the end of the day, we're trying to come up with a blue book formula for selling something. And I could probably go to Kelly Blue Book and I can look up a Rolls Royce from 1970 and it has a $300,000 average value. And I may own, I don't own one, but I may own one. And I may be the only one in the Puget Sound region that owns one. And so I'm not going to sell mine for 300000 because it has more value to me than that. And yeah. so, you know, I may say it's 400000 People may say, you're, well, you're crazy. You're clearly overvaluating. You're not in touch with reality. Whatever. It's mine. I own it. Yeah, and I'm not going to exactly. sell it. So, you know, and, and I think a lot of people. Thanks, Peter. Free market capitalism. Right. Exactly. So, you know, what you're doing is you're providing a base methodology that people can look at and have a discussion around. The factors are defined. It uses Google information, some of which may be outdated, some of which may be updated. Yeah. It, it allows you to now say, I'm not just putting my finger in there. I'm not just using an online calculator where I don't get to see all the factors yeah. that get evaluated. I'm looking at, this is how I'm evaluating it. Let's have a discussion about these factors and why I think they come into the, cool. why I think they're important to the valuation. Yeah, and one thing also that we need to remember is that the formula assumes liquidity, okay? And what I mean right. by that is that we're assuming that we have a seller who wants to sell at a fair market value and a buyer who wants to buy and is willing to pay a fair market value. Um, just because you plug your domain name into the formula doesn't mean that there's somebody out there willing to pay that price, right? right? But we need to start somewhere. We need to establish a valuation methodology. And, you know, so far, nobody has shown me anything that, that you know, a, a better 
manner of, of doing so. Hey, I've been using this for over a year. I have adjusted down the uh, estimated click-through rate myself because I know from a search engine standpoint how hard it is to get to the top yeah. point. But, you know, when I've bought some domain names, I use this. I evaluate it. I, I go online and I look at those valuations also, but I compare them all. I know what goes into this. And I think it's a fair way to estimate the uh, value. And I've done a number of transactions as a result of it. So, you know, yep. people can go out and use whatever they want. It's good to ha come back and provide constructive feedback. But if, you know, uh, like Rick Schwartz said, if you got a complaint, you know, there's a complaint department for that. If yeah. you have something to contribute, <laughs> we want to hear that. Absolutely. Um, as always, if you have a follow-up question, please post it in the comments below, and we'll ask Andrew to come back and answer as many as he can. If um, people want to follow you, Andrew, you're on spearfishing.com. They can they can follow you on Twitter, at spearfishing.com, and also like you on Facebook, spearfishing.com. Um, media options. Are you on Twitter for media options also? I think you are. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure we're Twitter slash media options. Great, and I'll link through to that so people can follow your latest on there. Andrew Rosner, CEO of MediaOptions.com and founder of Spearfishing.com. Thank you for coming back on the show, sharing your knowledge of community development, domain name valuation, and thank you again for being a domain Sherpa. Thank you, Michael, for the opportunity. It's always a pleasure. Likewise. Thank you all for watching. We'll see you next time.